Wow. Was that worship or what? Woo! Woo! Thank you, team. That was amazing. Please stay standing as I read scripture. I'm going to be reading from uh, four different passages. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Sunday is my favorite day of the week because I'm here with you. There's no better place to be on Sunday morning than church, to be with God's people and to worship an amazing God. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'm reading Psalm 27, verse 4, to start. One thing I ask of the Lord, that is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, to seek him in his temple. Philippians 3, 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, we just sang about that, didn't we? Amen to that. And Jesus says in John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. I am in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. And finally, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about what, who, those who <clears throat> fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. <clears throat> According to the Lord's own word, we, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with a voice of the archangels, and with a trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise after that, we who are still alive, may it be today, <clears throat> and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. May God add understanding to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Thank you. Well, good morning. How's everyone doing today? Good, good, good. Is your bracket busted yet? Those of you who are... I live for March Madness. I love it. When we were in Hong Kong, we weren't able to watch it. And so on, on Friday, a uh, dear brother asked, hey, what are you doing on Friday? I said, I have an appointment. My appointment was to sit in front of the TV and watch as much March Madness as I can and be really good at it. I love watching that. And I think there were a few people that were really certain about the fact that Purdue was going to beat FDU. And Beck and I, as we were watching, I said, you just watched history happen. I mean, that doesn't happen every day. You know, certainty. We can be certain about a lot of things, can't we? Well, I started my first church. We were in, uh, we were in Fairfield, Sassoon, California. And I soon became acquainted with a guy on the radio. His name was Harold Camping. Anybody ever hear of Harold Camping? Yeah. Harold Camping and his followers were absolutely, absolutely certain that Christ was going to return on September 6th, 1994. When I shared this with Pastor Sam, I looked at him and said, you weren't even born in 1994. I mean, did you talk about feeling old all of a sudden? He was convinced. We had a guy in our church who worked for United as a, uh, as a, as a mechanic for the planes sold or made sure that he, all of his debts were paid off, told all of his guys at the, at the shop, hey, I'm not going to be here on Monday morning. Christ is returning, and I'm not going to be here. Uh, Monday morning, he didn't show up for work because he was angry, because he's still here. Well, then Harold Camping, he kind of went into the background again, and come, uh, he came back out in 2005, and on 2005, he said, September 29th is the date. September 29, 2005, Christ is going to return. And he was certain of it. His followers were certain of it. Well, when that didn't happen, he backtracked. He said, no, no, no. He said, I was wrong by a few dates. It's actually October 2nd. And nothing happened. Then in, in 2011, he came out. And I don't know if you saw some of the stuff in 2011. Sam, you were born by that time. But in 2011, 
They spent a hundred million dollars. A hundred million dollars. They were, had vans with, uh, with the stickers on the side. Christ is going to return. The world is going to be destroyed. They had radio blitzes all about it. And on May 21st, Christ didn't return. And it's interesting that shortly after this, that Harold Camping had a stroke. And uh, it took him out of commission. They, they were certain. And you know, when you put your certainty and your hope in anything outside of Christ, it will never stand. Amen. It will never stand. In a few weeks, we get to celebrate Easter. Amen. If Christ doesn't return from the grave, forget it. Forget it. We, hold it. we have no hope. But because Christ rises from the dead, because he said, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be rejected by men, I'm going to be flogged, I'm going to be crucified, and after three days, I will rise again. And I love what the angel said, he's not here, he is risen, just as he said. And then we can have absolute certainty in the words of Christ. When Jesus says that even the Son of Man does not know when when the Savior will return, we shouldn't be fixing dates or times or even kind of putting um, seasons around it. But can we have certainty in anything? We can. We can have certainty in the things that that God has said in this morning as we continue in our deep dive into Psalm 23. We see three certainties that that David had. And as we look at them this morning, we read in in, Psalm 23, 6, it says, Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There's a certainty right there. He's saying, surely goodness and the word that's used there, love, change that to mercy. Because really in the original word, that's, that's really what it means. And I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. But David is saying, surely, surely goodness and mercy follow me. The word that's used there for follow is a word that actually means for, to pursue. It means to pursue, and it's the only time in the whole of the Old Testament that this word is used, pursue, in a way that it's not something evil is pursuing, because in every other instance, it's something evil is pursuing them. This is the only time when something good is is pursuing somebody. And David knew what it was like to be pursued, didn't he? David, Saul is king of Israel, and, and Saul messes up. And God comes along and he anoints, he anoints David king. And when would David be king? When God chose that David would be king. God would put him on the throne. And David knows that he's king. And Saul is absolutely jealous of, of David's because everything David does turns to gold. And David is pursued and he's within a hair, hair's breadth of being killed. David becomes king. And then as king... He is pursued later on in his reign by his own son, Absalom. Absalom wants to take the throne away, and David and several of his trusted men flee for their lives. And Absalom is dogged in his pursuit to seek to kill David. He pursues him. And David would have understood as well, when it, even if we want to use the word follow. Shepherds many times, when it came time to bring the sheep home at night, the sheep knew where, where home was. And you could, instead of leading the sheep, oftentimes the shepherd would follow in behind to make sure that the stragglers, the weak, the sick, they weren't picked off by predators. But what David is saying here is he says, surely goodness and mercy are following you. They're pursuing me. Do we realize today that God is pursuing us? It was Henry Blackaby in his Experiencing God series that said, God is pursuing you to have a relationship with you, a relationship that is real, that is personal, is based on his love. You may have come here today and you may say, I don't even believe in God. That's okay. God believes in you and God desires to have a relationship with you, a relationship that is real, that is personal, and that is based upon his love. And he pursues you. He pursues you with what? He pursues you with his goodness. It says there, he says, surely goodness and mercy will pursue me, will follow me all the days of my life. The goodness of God. As we read in Psalm 100, verse 5, it says, Know that the, as we read there, it says, For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. What does it say there? The Lord is what? He's good, and there's another scripture that also says he's not only good part of the time, he's good all the time. This is one of his perfections. He is absolutely good, and everything that God does 
is good. More on that in a minute, because I know some of you already got some objections coming up. But he says he's good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness through all generations. Psalm 100, verse 3, says this. Okay, last week, yeah, this, this old guy forgot. It was there, but I forgot to read it. If you're new to our church, through every sermon series that we preach, we learn a memory verse. And this is our memory verse that we've had, and you guys thought that I might forget again this week. No, 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 no. If you are a visitor, you get a pass. You get a pass on this one. And our scripture, let's just read it together, and then we're going to do a little bit harder stuff on it. Know that the Lord is God. This is an all play. It is He. He says, know that the Lord is God. Know that the Lord is God. Let me just stop here for a second. When I was in college, first day of college, I, I meet this gal who's got this name, Becca. And when I, when, I, when I heard that name, it was a Becca. Be- I, you know, growing up Lily White, I'd grown up in, in Watertown, Wisconsin. I'd never heard the name Becca in my life. I said, who on earth would name their kid Becca? What kind of person is this? But the more that I, I saw her, the more it's like, oh, yeah, I would really like to get to know this gal. And so I learned a lot about her. I knew that she was from, she'd grown up in Laos. I knew that, uh, uh, that she uh, did a lot of things with Asians. And so at our college, we had on Thursdays, I don't know if they still have, but on Thursdays, we gathered together in prayer bands. And this group prays for Africa. This group would pray for Asia, for Europe, or whatever. And I thought, okay, she's from Southeast Asia. She's going to be at the, Asian, at the Southeast Asian prayer group. That should include me right off the, off the bat, that she doesn't do things the way I thought that she would. And I was there. Why? I wasn't there to hear about, about Southeast Asia. I was there because I wanted to meet this girl again. I wanted to talk to her. And I knew that she played volleyball, and I would go to watch her play her volleyball games. And I was an older freshman, and all my, all my friends were seniors at that time, and they would heckle her and all this other kind of stuff. And I really wanted to go out with her. I pursued her to have a relationship with her because I wanted to get to know who she was. And the more that I got to know her, and now we're married 38 years, the more that I, I love her now. And you know, that's the way it is with God. He doesn't just desire to be fire insurance for you. He desires to have a relationship with you. A relationship that is real. It is personal and based on his love. He says, know that the Lord is God. The only way that you get to know him and to know that he's God is by spending time with him. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Okay, now let's crank it up a notch. Next screen. Okay. This is where you guys get to play. All right, so go ahead. All right, pretty good. Next slide. All right. Some of you are just moving your lips. You're just trying to get away with this. But he says, know that the Lord is God. All that God does is good. And for some of you, you're raising the objections right now. If God is good and all that he does is good, then why are these things happening in my life? And we read in Romans 8.28, we read these words. And we know, Romans 8.28, please. And we know that in all things, that is a huge line. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purposes. All things are not good. But in all things, God can bring glory and God is working for good in your life. He is pursuing you with his goodness. God is pursuing you because not all things are good. I think about, I think about a friends, of, friends of ours that I've talked about before in Hong Kong, David and Jenny. They're so excited to have their first baby. And when they found out that the, they found out through amniocentesis that the baby had a lot of a lot of issues with her, little Mara had only a portion of a of a brain, and the doctors when they found this out they said abort, 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 and they chose to keep little Mara, and when little Mara was born, I, this was during, right in the height of COVID, 
and I called them up and, and I said, so what did you name her? And, and they said, uh, we named her Mara. And I'm thinking, Mara, 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 like the book of Ruth, Mara? Don't call me, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. Mara means bitterness. And, and, I, and then she goes, you know, like in the book of Ruth, Mara, you know, Naomi and Mara? And she said, I said, why did you do that? And she said, when we found out all that was going to happen with baby Mara, we were so angry with God. God, why? Why would you allow our child to be like that? But then as we walked through the time of our pregnancy and we saw God show up again and again and again, he said we came up with her middle name, which is Grace, Mara Grace. Just before we left Hong Kong, we got to see and hold little Mara Grace. She was a little over a year by that time. Mara is blind, Mara is deaf, Mara is mute. Mara will never walk, she will never run, she will never do anything but lay in your arms. But she is the sweetest little baby you will ever meet in your life. And to see what it's done for for, uh, David and Jenny, and they've given me permission to share this story with you, but to just see how it's changed their life. There's a joy. When they hold that little one, there is a joy in their hearts. It is a a 24-hour-a-day job to take care of little Mara. But God has blessed them. God's goodness was pursuing them. As well, you have a a teacher who has a promising career. Promising career, and one day walks in and is being told that, that she's being demoted. God, why? God, why would you do that? Or the couple... A couple we know that uh, they're, 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 they just retired. They built a big home for themselves and for their grandchildren. They have a large home. And just finding out now they have cancer, and it's really bad cancer. And, and the question you know, that you always ask is, God, why? God, God, why would you do that? If God is good and all that he does is good, then why does God do that? And the theological answer is, I don't know. I don't know, because can we know the heart of God? But there are times that God, in his sovereignty, in his sovereignty, allows things, there's the major word, allows things in our lives to bring about his good. God is working in those situations many times to show us something about ourselves and something about himself that we would never learn had we not walked through that time. I was reading or listening to a story of an evangelist who, with, with the Christian Mission Alliance who traveled throughout Vietnam just prior to the days of uh, Vietnam falling to the communists. And while he was traveling, he, got, he had the services of a young translator by the name of Hien. And Hien went with him all up and down uh, Vietnam. They ministered to Vietnamese soldiers. They mi- ministered in universities. Saw thousands of people won to Christ. The evangelist left and went back to the United States, and he and it was shortly after this that Vietnam fell to the communists, and he and was swept up with many others who worked with the U.S. With US government, and he was sent to a re-education camp. He said day after day he heard over the loudspeakers the, the, the teachings of Lenin and Marx to the point where one night he said, he said before the Lord, I can't believe that you are real any longer. And I will not pray to you anymore. I will not believe in you any longer. If you can't help me out in the midst of this situation, then I don't believe you. I don't believe that you're here with me. The next morning, they all had to go and stand up, you know, in line to, uh, for, uh, what, do you, what do you call it, uh, the time, roll call, that's it. I'm not a soldier. Go for roll call. And as he stood there, one of the officers said, he and you have latrine duty today. You have to clean the officer's latrine. And he had said it was an awful job. It was the worst job that you could get. And as he went into, the, went into the latrine, his eye saw a piece of paper on the ground. And he noticed it had English writing on it. He hadn't read English in years. And he looked around, and he took the piece of paper and wiped it on his pants and put it in his pocket. And that night he, got, he went under his, under his covers and he looked with a light. And what do you think it was? It was a piece of scripture. And what scripture was it? It was Romans 8.28 is what it was. And he said, God, it hasn't even been 24 hours. And you've proven to me that not only do you care, but that you are with me in the midst of this time. 
And he volunteered the next day to do latrine duty because every day that he went in there, there was an officer who had been given a, a, a Gideon Bible. And because he couldn't read English, he was using the Gideon Bible as his toilet paper. But he and soul was so hungry for what it was that God wanted to teach him. But even in the midst of that really horrible time, God was saying, I'm here, I'm with you. And I don't know what you're walking through this morning, but we can walk with the absolute certainty that God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. His goodness is pursuing you right now. And I want you to just do something with me right now where you're at. Think about what it is that you're walking through. Okay, got that? And with that in mind, would you repeat with me? God is in this, and God is good. Okay, one more time. God is in this, and God is good. And that's truth. That's absolute certainty. But it's not just His goodness, it's His mercy as well. His mercy, the word that, that's being used there for love, it says, surely goodness and love will follow me. The word there is, is the word, the, I'm going to geek you for a second. The word there in the Hebrew is chesed. It, it's not just love. It, it's, it, it's, a, it's a faithful love. It's a covenantal love. It's mercy. It's, it's all wrapped up into one. It's really a two-sided coin. On the one side is the covenantal love of God. The covenant meant to cut. And literally, when it, when it says that, it, it's a faithful love. It says, it says much like what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2. It says, even if we are faithful, faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. God is faithful. We can tell God, hey, I don't want to have anything more to do with you. We can go off and live a life the way that we want to live, and God will not turn his back on us. God remains faithful to us. And I don't know where you're at. I don't know where you've come from today. But sometimes we do things or we've been away from God for a while. And we think that God can't love me anymore or God won't love me anymore. And nothing is farther from the truth. Those are lies from the enemy. Because God says, I choose to love you. This covenantal love is a choice to love us. Even on our worst days. Genesis chapter 15. It's not up here. Genesis chapter 15 is where we see this coming out. Genesis chapter 15, God comes to Abraham and he says to Abraham that your descendants, you're going you're gonna to be the father of many nations. He says, how can this be? He says, I'm an old man and my wife's an old man. And God says, go outside and look at the stars. And he takes them out and looks at the stars and he says, if you can count the stars, that's what your descendants are going to be like. And it says, Abraham believed and God credited him as righteousness. And then God says to him, take an oxen, take a lamb. And he said, and prepare them for a sacrifice. And what they would have done is they would have cut the oxen in half, put one side on one side and one side on the other. Taken the lamb, cut it in half, put it on one side and put it on the other. Because literally to do a covenant means, it's the word karat, it means to cut in half. And then they would have taken birds. They wouldn't have cut them in half and they would have put them over here. And normally what happened in a covenantal agreement is both parties would walk in between those animals that are cut, saying in effect that if I ever break this covenant, let what happened to these animals happen to me. Only in this instance, what does God do with Abraham? He puts him to sleep. And who is the one that walks between those animals? It's God. God says, I choose to love you. I choose to remain faithful to you. That's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is the grace and the mercy of God. Lamentations chapter 2, it, or chapter 3, it says, The steadfast, I don't know who else needs to hear this today. The steadfast love of the Lord never what? It never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Today, God's mercies were new to you again. And I don't know, again, what it is that we walk through because why does God leave us here? Why does David say this? Surely goodness and love or surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Because I think, I think that he, we, he does it because in the midst of difficulties that we walk through, we need to remember that God is good and that he's in this and that he's pursuing me with his good in mind. He is pursuing you and pursuing us with his good in mind. And I think the other side, the mercy side, 
because there are times that we believe the lies of the enemy that I've done something, I've said something, I haven't done something, I haven't said something, and now God, God won't love me. God won't forgive me. Is there a sin that God won't forgive? God will forgive, and God chooses to love. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. There comes the second. That, that's the second certainty. The certainty that this world is not my home. Amen. He says, <laughs> amen is right. I'm glad that this world is not our home. This isn't all that there is. He says, all the days of my life. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, your life is inextricably tied to Christ. He says in Psalm 139, 9 verse 16, he says, all the, days of my, all the days ordained for me are written in your book before one of them ever came to be. Before one of them ever came to be. God knows everything. He knows every page of your book. He knows when the book is going to end. He started the book. And he knows when it's going to end. And he says, all the days of your life are ordained are, are written in my book before one of them ever came to be. And as a believer, our lives are tied to Christ. As a believer, our lives are tied to Christ. And he says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, and yet not I live, but Christ lives within me. This life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who has set me free. Our lives are tied to Christ. And because of that, this world is not my home. Jesus says in John chapter 17, he says, they are not of this world. He's speaking of his disciples, even as I am not of this world. And Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, he says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so what? So what, what does that mean? If my citizenship isn't here, if this world isn't all that there is, what does that mean for the time that I have here on this earth? What should I be investing in here while I'm on this earth? Should I be investing in those things that are just going to stay here on this earth? Or should I invest in those things that have heavenly value as well? Somebody said that we take nothing with us to heaven. I wonder about that. I know we can't take, you know, somebody said... Uh, when, when a, a very, very wealthy man died, he said, how much, did, how much did he leave? All of it. All of it. But I wonder, can we take those that we love with us? Can we invest in their lives in such a way that, that they come to know Christ? That's why as a pastor, early on in ministry, when we were interviewed by boards to come to the church, one church asked me, they said, what did you mean here in your, in your statement that you won't sacrifice your family on the altar of ministry? I said, it means that I put my family first. My family comes first because there I'm being held accountable for my family. And our families should be important. And our children should be important. And some of you have prodigals, kids that have not, are not walking with the Lord. Don't stop praying for them. Don't stop praying and asking that the Lord would bless them with a heart after his own heart. Remember we talked about praying blessing over people? Pray that the Lord would bless them with his heart. And pray that the Lord would bless them with eyes that see and hearts that feel what it is that God is, is doing in their lives. This world isn't all that, that there is. And my investment should be in things, in, not of this world, but things that are going to go on before me. When we were in Hong Kong, we had a family, a Nigerian family, and it was so cool. In, a, in an international church, you see people come to, to, the Indians would come dressed in, in Indian garb on Sunday morning. The Africans would all come dressed in, in African garb. It, it was really cool to see that. And this family, uh, he was studying for his doctorate, and uh, he and his wife, uh, they had a little boy. And Beck and I went over to visit them in their, in their flat. Oh, my goodness. It was so hot. When we went, we, I mean, Hong Kong is hot enough to start with, and normally the AC is going when you, when you walk into a home. This place was so hot; it was like, what on earth? And they said, we just we just really really like it hot in our home. 
And it reminded me of a story I was reading about a guy. He was a, another Nigerian student studying at a, uni- at a university in Winnipeg. And his roommate said, this guy is the oddest guy I've ever seen in my life. He wears these African clothes all the time. He eats African food. And he said, in our room, he said, he keeps the temperature cranked as hot as it can get in there. And he said, it's like, I asked him, I said, can you please turn down the heat in the room? And he said, no. And he said, why? Why won't you turn down the heat? And he said, I always want to remember that Canada is not my home, that Africa is why I come here. He said, students come to Canada, they study here, and they stay here. And he said, I want to remember that Canada is not my home, but that I'm going one day back to Nigeria, where it was that I came from. And we need to remember as well, this world is not our home. Yes, while we live here, yes, while we live here, it's it's our home. But our home is with Christ. Isn't that what it says? Our citizenship, Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly, do we? We eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. This was the third third certainty that, that David had. And it said, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And as we, as we read that, you know, there, are some, there are some commentators who say, you can't really mean, that that really doesn't mean forever in heaven. The problem with that is this. Genesis says that you were created in the image of God. Because we were created in the image of God, we were created with a soul, a soul that will live on in eternity in one of two places. That's the certainty. The certainty is that I will live in one of two places forever. I will. I will live in one of two places forever, and that place will be the place of your choosing, not God's. God will never force us to choose Him. And we read as well that, and we read as well that we're not created for this world, but we're created for eternity. And we'll all spend an eternity in one of two places. Matthew chapter 25, verse 46 says, They will go. I hate to preach on this, but it's truth. They'll go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. See, there's two sides of eternality. There's one side that's eternal punishment. For those who choose to reject the mercy and the love and the grace of God, they choose to receive what it is that they've asked for. And for those who choose to receive the free gift of salvation, they choose, they they receive eternal life. Now can I just stop there for a second? Because there are some objections already where those who some would say, that's not fair. That is not fair. There's teaching that, that hell will go on for a while, and then, then it will end. Okay, they'll punish people for a while, but then they'll end. But it's like, what loving God on earth, or what loving God would there ever be that would, that would sentence people to an etern- eternal time of punishment? No God of love would ever do that. And I would say, yes, he didn't. He gave us his son to take our place. That's right. Hallelujah. He gave us his son to take our place. And if we choose to reject that, we choose to receive what it is that we've asked for. And that's a hard one. That's a hard one. But in the same way that there's an eternal nature to, to life, to life with eternal life, There's also an eternal nature to punishment away from God. It says in in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 2, that is appointed unto man once to die, and after that comes the judgment. There's no reincarnation. It's after we die, we'll go to one of two places. and It'll be the place of your choice. Next scripture, please. What do you do with that? What do you do with that? Uh, 
for those in the Christian Missionary Alliance and many other missionary groups, this is what drove many to go to places where the gospel wasn't. Because they wanted to take the gospel where people had never heard. Even today, in our membership class we've been talking over the last few weeks, the Alliance today is going to the places where the least reached places of the world, where it's really dangerous to be a believer. We have a friend that, that we work with uh, as pastoral care couple, and this person is the only one in our denomination that has to call each week to say, I'm still alive. And I think about that. Why is this person where they're at? Because lost people matter to God. Lost people matter to God, and they deserve to be found. Okay, the question to rise, church, is do lost people matter to us? Because this is reality for those who don't know Christ. And God has placed each and every one in a specific place. He's put you in a neighborhood. He's put you in a, in a, a, a workplace with people who don't know Christ, with people who have no hope. And if this is the best thing since sliced bread, then why are we keeping it a secret? Why are we keeping it to us? May I encourage you to ask the Lord, open my eyes. Open my eyes to those who don't know. And God, fill me with your spirit and fill me with a boldness to share you with those people that you've put in my path. And remember, we've talked about when somebody begins talking about church, about God, about the Bible, about prayer, your antenna should go up because that's God at work in their lives, and he's saying, hello, ding, 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 ding. Um, I'm inviting you to join me in what it is that I'm doing. Because God's word says that there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that seeks after God. So when someone is talking about that, that's God who's at work in their life, and he's giving you an invitation to join him in what it is that he's already doing there. Lost people matter to God and deserve to be found. The next scripture, please. <coughs> Because to spend an eternity away from God is to spend an eternity away from His presence. He'll punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty, and from the majesty of His power. Next scripture, please. So there's two sides of this. And for those of us who know Christ, there's, there's hope, there's a certainty that we will spend an eternity with Him. But that certainty should drive us to share Christ with as many people who don't know Him. You know, a good place to do that, a, a, a safe place to do that is within your small group. That's a really good place to start with people who don't know Christ. Invite, invite, you, know, you invite them into Sunday morning, and, and especially I, I've been in churches when I don't know when to stand up or when to sit down, and I don't, I don't know what, what's being read. Or, you know, and you come, in, come into a new church, and I have to tip my hat to you or visitors because it's not easy to come into a church when you don't know the people and you don't know what it is that they do there and you don't know all the stuff about it. But when you invite them into a small group, you invite them into a place that's, that's a whole lot safer with a much smaller group of people to where, you can, where they can see. And we had that happen to us in Hong Kong. Becca's getting on the, on the shuttle bus to go come to church. She would come after me. And the lady leans across from her and says, where can I find a Bible study? <laughs> you know, we hardly ever got talked to on the bus because most of the people spoke Cantonese and we didn't. And we didn't. And this lady strikes up the conversation and says, where can I find a Bible study? And Becca said, well, we don't have a Bible study, but we have a small group. Turns out they lived in the apartment building just across the way from us, and that led to them beginning to come to church as well. It was a safe place. And inviting people in and, and looking and saying, God, give me wisdom, give me vision. How is it that I can reach people who don't know you? Because for the believer... He says, brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. When you see that, think of death, those who've died, 
or to grieve, as, grieve like men, like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him, those who have died in him. And he said, and according to the Lord's own words, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left to the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. And I love that last word. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. That is the certainty and the hope that you have as a believer. On your worst day, this is the certainty that you have as a believer. That's what leads you back to the mercy of God. That's what leads you back to the goodness of God. Because this is a certainty of God, that we will be with the Lord forever. And I don't know where you're at today on your spectrum of maybe your heart, things have happened in your heart and you're thinking, God, will he forgive me? He absolutely will. It's this truth that drives us back to the goodness and to the mercy of God. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Encourage one another. I think about that. Told this before, if you would have told me 40 years ago that I would be standing up in front of people, preaching God's word and and wanting to preach and loving to preach. I'm an introvert. And by nature, I, I, I like to hide in the background. And I wanted to be a forest stranger. I wanted to be as far away from people as I could. And God has a funny sense of humor, and he wanted me, to, wanted me to do this. And I really believe a part of that is the prayers of my godly grandparents. Grandparents that I will see one day again in heaven. This past week, I celebrated the birthday of my brother. I talked about him a couple weeks ago. He had melanoma cancer, and we prayed for him. But at age 35, God said, my grace is sufficient. And God took my brother home. I'm going to see him. My wife and I are going to hold a daughter that we never got to hold. And our kids are going to be able to play with a sister that they never saw. I'm going to get to see a brother, another brother that passed on before me. And all of the other people. And why why am I up here today? It's because of prayers like godly grandparents. People that we will see again one day. And heaven is going to be a place where there's not going to be any more tears. And I talked about that a couple weeks ago. I think there's still going to be tears of joy. But he's going to wipe away the other tears of sadness. I'm never going to struggle with a bad back again. I'm not going to have to wear these any longer. And I hope one day we're never going to have to shave again. (laughs) But it's going to be a place. (laughs) It's going to be a place where we're going to be with Christ. And here's the thing. This is just a warm-up for an eternity with Christ. And we're going to be spending time getting to know him for eternity. Because we can't know everything there is to know about God, otherwise we would be God. So while we're here on this earth, how's it going with your soul? Is there a desire in your soul to want to spend more time getting to know God? Is the desire of your heart to just, I I can't wait to get into your word in the morning. Is the desire of your heart to, to spend time in prayer with him and to get to know him better? And, and if it's not, maybe today is the day before you leave the parking lot to say, God, renew in me a clean heart. Change my heart, God. And God, give me a passion and a desire for you again because I'm going to spend an eternity getting to know you. And this is just the warm-up for that. Do you know where you're going to spend an eternity? Billy Graham was interviewed shortly before he passed away. And he said, uh, you see this suit? He said, uh, or he was, let me back up a minute. He was sharing a story about Albert Einstein on a, on a train, a commuter train in, in the Boston area. And the conductor came up and he said, tickets please, tickets please. And as he came up to Dr. Einstein's chair, uh, he said, tickets please. And 
he did one of these. He's looking around for his ticket, and he says, and finally the conductor said, okay, Dr. Einstein, he said, I'll, I'll be back. He said, I'll go down the rest of the car. And he said, I'll come back, and he said, I'll check on you in a little bit. Came back, and he said, here's Einstein. Under the chairs, he said, all of his bags were open, and he said, Dr. Einstein, it's okay. He said, he said I, I, I believe you that you bought a ticket. And he said, I know I bought a ticket, but he said, I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> to which Billy Graham said, you see this suit? He said, my kids got on me, he said, because I, they said I was looking kind of frumpy, and they wanted me to have a new suit. And he said, this is the suit I'm going to be buried in. And he said, when you see me again in this suit, he said, remember two things. That not only do I know who I am, but I know where I'm going. Do you know who you are? Are you a Christ follower? You're called to live that way. As we have walked through this series on the 23rd Psalm, we have seen the absolute care and the goodness and the mercy of God again and again and again. That's the God who is for you. He's not against you. That's who you are. If you are a believer in Christ, that's who you are. Like he said, do you know where you're going? Do you have that absolute assurance? As I look around, I see some of you, even this morning as I was walking through here, and I'm thinking, okay, do I have the absolute assurance? That's yes. Because I know that there was a day where I... I knelt before somebody in, uh, in Minnesota as a young man and prayed to receive Christ, and I know at that point my life was changed. Does that mean that I immediately became a good person? <laughs> no, it didn't. But I'm growing, and I'm getting to know God in the midst of this. Do you know who you are? Are you growing in that relationship with God? And secondly, do you know where you spend eternity? This morning, I don't want to take any, um, anything for granted. As I look around the room, I don't want to take anything for granted that, um, that you're a believer or not a believer. And I want to give you an opportunity, if you've never prayed to receive Christ, to receive Him. It's a free gift. You say, what do I got to do? Three very simple things. First is, you have to admit that you're a sinner. I don't know about you, that's not always hard for us to do, is it? You have to admit that you're a sinner. The second thing you need to to do is you need to admit that you need a Savior. We're tough people here in Wisconsin. We live through snow in March. Hmm. We're tough, but we're not tough enough to get to heaven. We can't do enough good stuff to get to heaven. For this, we need Christ. You have to admit that you need a Savior and repent of that sin. And the third thing is you need to receive. So that sounds too easy. Why does it always have to be hard? It's a gift. It's a gift. We got a, we, my, uh, grand, one of my granddaughter's birthday was this week, and I, I asked back, I never remember this stuff. I said, did, did, you, did, you, did you send Bryn a, a, card, a card and a gift for, for her birthday? Yes, yes, I, I took care of that. And she wrote back, uh, she did a video for us last night thanking us for that, thanking us for the gift. I mean, she got the gift, and she said, I feel so rich now. I said, what did you put in the card? She said, just a little bit of money. Well, to a five-year-old kid, she's rich. And, <laughs> and in reality, it was just a little bit. But as I, I think about that, it was just a gift. And she didn't choose to leave it lay there, but she chose to receive it. And God offers you a gift this morning. If you've never prayed to receive him, I want to invite you to do that very simple thing. When we go to prayer, I'm going to pray for some other things, but I'm going to go to prayer and I'm going to ask specifically if you have never prayed to receive Christ, if you'd like to do that, I want you to do a really simple thing. I want you to just simply look look up at me when we go to prayer, okay? And then afterward, I'm going to follow up with you if you did pray to receive Christ, okay? So let's pray. Lord God in heaven, I thank you for your word. And your word says that all scripture is God-breathed. And it carries authority. And your word shows us who you are. 
And over these past six, seven weeks, we have seen a side of you, your, your mercy and your care. And then, Lord, in these last weeks, for some of us, these have been difficult weeks. But today we heard again how you pursue us. You pursue us with your goodness and with your mercy. And I pray, Lord, for those who are walking through difficulty today. That they would be able to say again and again that you are in this and you are good. Lord, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the blessing of the comfort and compassion on those who this is a really difficult season. And I thank you that, Lord, your love for us is never-ending. Your mercies are new every morning and your faithfulness is great. And I pray, Lord, for those this morning who came and just shake their head and say, there's no way. There is no way that God could love me. And yet, Lord, you know everything there is to know about us and you still choose to love us. You don't ask us to stay there, but you choose to love and you choose to forgive. God, I will never understand the depth of your love for us. But I am thankful that, Lord, you are a God who cares. God, I thank you that this world isn't all that there is. And I pray that, Lord, we would not be so heavenly minded that we're, not, that we're no earthly good. And I pray that, Lord, you would help us to lay up treasures in heaven. That, Lord, you would give us a boldness to share you with those who don't know you. And, Lord, I also thank and praise you for the, the certainty of an eternity with you. When there won't be any more temptation. When there won't be any more hurt. When there will be no one gossiping about us. When the words that are said about us are kind. And when we will see you and we will see you and be seen. God, thank you. Thank you for the certainty and the hope that you give us in Christ. And I thank you that, Lord, we can know. We can know because your word says that I write these things to you believe that you will know that you have everlasting life. You want us to know because you want us to live with passion. And I pray and I ask, Father, in the name of Jesus, that, Lord, you would be speaking right now to hearts. If you came here this morning and you say, Pastor, I don't know Christ, but I would like to pray to receive him, I want you to do just that, that simple thing right now, just look it up at me. Is that what you'd like to do? Okay, rest the Lord. Then just pray along with me in your heart. Precious Heavenly Father, I thank you for the gift of Jesus. And today I admit to you that I am a sinner. I'm not proud of that. But I receive you today. Or I also admit that I need you as Savior. And I repent and turn from my sin. And today, Lord, I receive you as my Savior. Come into my life and make me new. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There is nothing better than to pray and to welcome somebody into the kingdom of heaven.
And God says that all heaven rejoices when one, when one comes home. And this morning, as we leave here today, we leave with two injunctions. One is that rejoice in that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, but also looking for those people who don't know Christ because lost people matter to God. And one person came home today. And I praise the Lord for that. Amen is right. Amen is right. Amen. So after service, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meet with the one who prayed with me. And because in our church, when somebody comes to Christ, it's just like a baby. We don't put them in the crib and say, grow. Uh, you, you come alongside and you work with them and you walk alongside of them. And today, that's what I'll be talking about with that person. So I'm going to meet with a couple of you. But uh, after, afterward, I'm going to be meeting with this one. So Lord bless you. You have a great week. And just, just give me two minutes uh, to talk about what's coming up. Next week's a one-off sermon. I'll be talking in John chapter 11 with Jesus and Lazarus leading up to his time of where he came into, into Jerusalem. On 2 April, okay, second, on the 2nd of April, um, we have a very, very special speaker coming. Her name is Bao He. Bao was from this church, and Bao was a, was a missionary in China. She and her husband, Jing Su, and now Bao is one of the vice presidents of our denomination of all things. Bao grew up in this church. Bao is from this church, and you guys had an integral part in sending her out. If you would have told my father and mother-in-law worked with the Hmong when they were in Laos, and if you would have told them 50 years ago that a vice president of our denomination would not only be a Hmong, but a Hmong woman, they would have said, no way would that ever have happened. She is a phenomenal speaker. Please, do everything you possible to make, to make it here that day. She is a phenomenal speaker and just has her fingertips on what is going on in our denomination all over the world. Then Easter Sunday morning, I am looking so forward to it. We have service here. We have service on Good Friday as well. That will start at 6. And, but with Easter Sunday morning, we're going to have more chairs set up in here. And we just encourage us. As, as regulars, if you're a regular, been coming to church here for a long time, park a ways away from the church to allow visitors to be able to park close to the church. And as they come, uh, make sure you move into the middle to give more people seats because um, I think the place is going to be full on, on Easter Sunday morning. And Easter Sunday will also be a time of very, very clear gospel presentation on Easter Sunday morning. So if you have loved ones who don't know Christ, it's a really good time to invite them as well. Have a great day, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.